Hello and welcome again to Encouraging Words. This time of encouragement, it is through uh, the scriptures that we are encouraged, that we receive hope. So I know that you're going to be encouraged. I know you're going to receive hope because uh, we're going to look into God's word together. So if you have your Bible, please, please keep it close by. Follow along. Make it your own because it is yours. If you have your computer or phone or tablet, use that as well. Whatever you have that contains the powerful word of God, let's use that right now. Let's pray and we'll get started. Uh, Father, we ask your blessing upon this time. Father, open our eyes to see. Lord, open our ears to hear. Please, Holy Spirit, teach us. Bring into remembrance all things. Lead us into all truth. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to pick up where we last left off, and that is the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3. Chapter 3, the Gospel of Mark, verse 1. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man with a withered hand, and there was a man with a withered hand. So there's this man with this described as a withered hand, a dead hand. We're not told how his hand became this way. What we do know is his legs work. And he's there that day. His legs uh, took him to the synagogue that day. And they, those legs brought him in the presence of Jesus. So we know how he gets to Jesus, and for us, we use what we got to get to Jesus. Notice verse 2, And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. Who's watching? Well, the religious leaders, the enemies, the scribes. They're, they're looking to see what Jesus is going to do. You know, so, so, so many times the enemies of Jesus know him better than his actual followers. They know Jesus is going to have compassion. They know Jesus has a heart to heal this man's hand. So was he planted there on purpose? Uh, was it all by a plan to uh, accuse Jesus of wrongdoing? Possibly. Possibly so. Yet Jesus will use this man to reveal the glory of God, even if it's on the Sabbath you see, man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. The Sabbath, the day of rest, was made for people to rest. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And no day, no day of the week is going to stop him from doing good. Verse 3, And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, those who were uh, looking to accuse him, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. Jesus calls the man to be in front of the synagogue, to be in front of the congregation. Then he directs a question to those who would seek to accuse him of wrongdoing because Jesus knows the hearts of men. Is it lawful to, um, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill, they refused to answer. They remained silent because they wanted to accuse Jesus of breaking the law, but they're guilty. They are guilty of conspiring to, to harm and to kill Jesus on this holy day. Even though it's the Sabbath day, which they believe to be holy, that doesn't stop them from having evil intentions and devising evil plans. They're the hypocrites. To answer Jesus' question, yes, it is lawful to do good. Yes, it is lawful to save life. It is evil to refuse to do good, uh, especially when it is within our means when we have the power to do so you see when the letter of the law stops good we need to say no to the letter of the law 
rather obey the spirit of the law and the spirit of the law is to show mercy to show kindness to others it's better to follow that law the spirit of the law verse 5 and he looked around them with anger grieved in the grieved at their hardness of heart and he said to the man stretch out your hand and he stretched it out and his hand was restored the pharisees went out immediately held counsel with the herodians against him how to destroy him jesus was angry but he did not sin the bible says we can be angry but do not sin in our anger he was grieved because of the hardness of their heart their hardness uh, caused them to oppose him to be against him to they were determined to resist and to rebel against him and everything that he stood for and taught they refuse to believe in him Jesus is grieved because of the hardness of their heart. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. He teaches it, it is better to do good. It is better to save life on the Sabbath than to do harm or to kill. He commands the man, stretch out your hand, and he does immediately his once, you know, withered hand, his once dead hand, it, his, it re restored back to its original form life has come back to what was once dead jesus can do that with a body part or he can do that with the whole body he can do that with the soul bring what was withered and dead and bring it back to life we get the sense that the the pharisees the scribes these uh, enemies were furious right they leave and then they go join forces with uh, the Herodians to destroy Jesus you see the Pharisees are a sect of the Sanhedrin this uh, council the Sanhedrin the Pharisees are uh, a group of that Sanhedrin the Herodians are loyalists to King Herod if you remember King Herod had John the Baptist killed. As a matter of fact, John was beheaded. So the Pharisees probably see now that the Herodians are, are their friends, their, their allies. If King, if King Herod is willing to, to kill John the Baptist, then maybe he's, he and his followers are willing to kill Jesus. In verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Edom, also known as Edom, this area, Edom, which is south of the Dead Sea, and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. Great crowds are coming from all over. The miracles of Jesus are just amazing out of this world. These miracles, they bring glory to God. They prove that Jesus has come from God. The problem with miracles is they come and go, right? They're fleeting. They don't last. And then we're longing and, and looking in for the next miracle which which may come or which it may never come in the absence of miracles we turn to the word of god the word of god is consistent reliable powerful it gives us life it's not something fleeting it's what god has given to us to transform our lives miracles are good Praise God for miracles. But the word of God changes our lives. The word of God will endure forever. Verse 9, And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. 
Jesus prepared to escape the pressure of the crowds because they uh, are so intense they could crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Just a touch. A touch can be healing. You know, uh, holding hands, a hug, right? Uh, a touch on the shoulder, right? Uh, a kiss from a loved one. It can be healing. A touch can be healing. John writes this, If any of you are sick, call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over you, anointing you with oil in the name of the Lord. Do that with touch. A touch can be healing. And just a touch from God can heal a disease, a sickness, an ailment in our lives. That's, that's amazing. Pray to the Father for healing because He cares for your anxieties and your worries. Pray and turn to the leaders of the church uh, for prayer as well and for anointing because um, that's uh, another way that God works to touch our lives is by using other people. Verse 11, And whenever the unclean spirit saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Jesus will not accept witness from these unclean spirits. Their confession is not coming from a place of trust and love, faith. John tells us not to believe every spirit. We are told to test the spirits whether they are from God or not. John, John writes this, Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. These unclean spirits, they identify him correctly, but their testimony doesn't come from the right spirit, the Holy Spirit. Every person must come to Jesus and discover for themselves who he truly is. We do not accept the testimony, the witness of unclean spirits. Neither is Jesus revealed by flesh and blood. Only the Spirit of God reveals to us that Jesus is the Christ, that he has come in the flesh, and he is the Son of the living God. Verse 13, And he went up on the mountain and called to, to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. Jesus calls his followers, his twelve, his apostles. Jesus said to them later on, the night before he dies, he says this, You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask, the Father in my name, he may give it to you. What a promise. Jesus calls and Jesus cares. For uh, each of us that are called by him, he will protect his own. We are his. He had in mind exactly who he wanted to continue uh, the work once he uh, goes to be with the Father in heaven. He calls, yes. He cares, yes. And he shows his followers how to produce good fruit. Verse 14, And he appointed twelve whom he had also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach. He called them so that they might be with him. Did you notice that? First, we answer the call, and then we are with him. We spend time with him. We observe him. We learn from him. We listen to him. Then we go out. Then we go out and preach. Then we go out in mission. First we answer the call, and then we spend time with We just be with him and enjoy being with him. The message of preaching 
the message is of utmost importance. The gospel we preach, the gospel is the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, right? It's a simple message, yet it is a powerful message. It's the message of God for saving all, all people. We tend to make the message complicated and, and, uh, and long. and We tend to do that. But the message of the gospel is believing in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins. And God promised that as far as from the east to the west, he will remember our sins no more. What another great promise. Verse 15, and have authority to cast out demons. They're given authority to preach, to cast out demons. Uh, the other Gospels mentioned they have the authority to heal as well. In a similar way, Christians today, right, we're called to preach, to cast out demons, and to heal. It's never in our own strength. No. It's never for our own glory. And it's never for self-interest or self-gain. If we preach... We preach the gospel to bring more people to the Lord. If we cast out demons, it's to set people free and to bring the light of Christ. And if we heal, it's not by our own power. It's, it's God working through us to, um, to reveal his healing power to others. It's always for the glory of God. Verse 16, he appointed the 12. These 12, save one, these 12 are in the, mentioned in the book of Revelation will be the foundation of the new Jerusalem. They're very important. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name uh, Bo Boanerges, Boanerges, that is the sons of thunder. Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, also called Nathaniel. And Matthew, also called Levi. And Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. That's a good name there. And Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Some we know more about others, right, in the New Testament. We don't, we don't learn about every single one of them. But definitely, on that list of 12, there's always that name that sticks out. Why did Jesus call Judas Iscariot? If Jesus knew all along that Judas was going to betray him, why call him in the first place? Maybe the better question should be, why did Jesus call you? Why did Jesus call me? The Lord calls the worst of us. He calls us uh, with an attitude, a character that he's willing to forgive us when we ask. Willing to show us compassion when we repent. He's always ready and willing to help us. Yet we must ask, yet we must repent and believe what Jesus did, what rather, what Judas did not do, what Judas failed to do after he betrayed Jesus was changed his mind and turned to Jesus and say, I messed up. I'm sorry, please forgive me. I can't believe I messed up. Today, we can learn from Judas. We can repent. We can change our mind when we messed up really bad. We can ask Jesus for forgiveness. And he's always willing and ready to forgive us. Verse 20, then he went home. And the crowd gathered again so that they could not even eat. 
And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, he's out of his mind. Those committed to God are often labeled as lunatics. I don't know if you've discovered that or not. He's crazy. Or she's lost her mind following God. I can't believe that. Jesus is accused of being out of his mind, yet he's not. He is fully committed to doing the will of God. And no doubt, his disciples are, are labeled and branded as crazy. Oh, they follow Jesus. They're crazy as well. Jesus said this, Wide and easy is the way, the path that leads to destruction. Narrow and hard is the way that leads to eternal life. He also said this, Blessed and happy are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Your reward is great in heaven. To be labeled a follower of Jesus, to be labeled a Christian, is a blessing. Verse 22, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul. Uh, and this name meaning the, the Lord of, of dung flies. And by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a, if a kingdom is divided against itself, the kingdom cannot stand if a house is divided against itself that house will not be able to stand and if satan has risen up against himself and has divided he cannot stand but is coming to an end you see satan does not work to defeat himself Satan works to steal, kill, and destroy. He works to possess and oppress, not to be re removed. He's seeking to control and possess it all, not to be removed. How can Satan cast out Satan? This would be self-defeating work. The, no ground would, would be made, no territory, no... No, there's nothing being conquered, right? A kingdom, a, a house, a, a person divided against itself will not be able to stand. Verse 27, But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Satan is the strong man. And his house, you might think of the world, but also uh, more specifically too, the people that he seeks or has possessed and oppressed. No one can take from Satan unless he is first bound. In this parable, Jesus has the authority and the power to bind Satan and to cast out his demons. Jesus does not cast out demons by the power of Beelzebul, by the power of a demon, by the power of the devil. No. Jesus has been given authority from the Father to drive out and cast out demons, and he's given that authority to his disciples as well. Verse 28, Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the children of men, and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now, can people commit this unpardonable, unforgivable, sin today can people do this today well on one hand right jesus is no longer physically with us makes sense 
He's no longer physically in this world performing miracles and casting out demons the way he did back then. If Jesus was here with us, then we could commit this unforgivable sin. We could uh, do this against him just like they're doing in this uh, uh, record here we're reading. In other words, directly calling Jesus a demon or the devil would be an unforgivable sin because it is by the Holy Spirit he casts out demons. They're, um, they're calling the work of God demonic. On the other hand, the only unforgivable sin that we could truly commit in this lifetime would be to reject the saving uh, work of Jesus Christ. For Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sins, the sins of the world. To reject, to reject the cross is to reject forgiveness. To reject Jesus is is to reject the Father who sent him and the Spirit that is working through him, right? Because they're the Trinity. The only unforgivable sin is choosing not to believe in the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ for all your sins is unbelief. Verse 31 in closing verses and his mother and his brothers came and standing outside they sent to him and called him and a crowd was sitting around him and they said to him your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you and he answered them who are my mother and my brothers and looking about at those who sat around him he said here are my mother and my brothers for whoever does the will of god he is my brother and sister and mother in Christ, we are closer to him than, he, than any blood relative when we are in Christ. Remember um, the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus. Uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Nic Nicodemus asked Jesus, how can a man enter his mother's womb and be born again and then Jesus said you must be born of the Spirit okay and thinking about that conversation Jesus is teaching us um, about spiritual birth being born again of the Spirit this is how we enter into relationship with Christ enter into the family of God those who do, do the will of God are in the family of God what is the will of God to receive the salvation that is offered to us through Jesus Christ how by belief by faith in the work of the cross Jesus died on the cross. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day according to the Gospels, the Scriptures. Jesus came to bring us all into the family of God. And we enter the family of God through the Spirit of God. How wonderful. We're going to stop right here. Please join me in a closing prayer. Uh, God, we thank you once again for um, your consistent, reliable, powerful word. Your word that transforms and changes our lives. Help us to turn to you, O oh God. When there's something withered and dead in our life, you're able to restore and revive just by a command, just by a word. Bring healing into our lives. Bless us with a touch also, a touch that can 
that, that can do what maybe a doctor can't do. A touch that can do what, that, what maybe the physician can't do. A touch from you, a touch from uh, other believers, a touch from leaders in the church. But we know you're behind the healing. You call us. You, you want us to be with you. To spend time with you. You call us to um, care for us. You call us to equip us and give us what we need to do what you've called us to do. We thank you for calling us, for caring for us, for giving us the authority to preach, to cast out demons, and to bring healing to others. We don't have to fear blaspheming the Holy Spirit. But God, help us to um, be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, not to quench or resist the Holy Spirit, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. Thank you for allowing us into your family, that you make it so that we are born of the Spirit. Help us to know that we have the inheritance. We, we are heirs according to the promise. We receive all the wonderful blessings of your word because we are in the family. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you.